I have been obsessed with secrets my whole life, with what lies beneath the surface, in the dark, all that you can sense but not see, all that many know exists but no one would talk about. I had no idea why I was so obsessed until a few years ago when I finally discovered the secrets within my own family. Now I know that I, a German, am the daughter of children of war, the granddaughter of a soldier of the Nazi regime, and refugees who had to leave their homes after 1945. I still have it in me. The shame and guilt my grandfather must have felt, my grandmother's fear when she tried to escape the soldiers of the Red Army, and my mother's urge to get enough to eat when she, as a child, was almost dying of hunger. Now I understand my own feelings better. I understand that I'm not responsible for my grandfather's actions. I understand why I'm always on alert, ready to run or defend myself, and why I have to have food nearby at all times. And I have become more at peace with myself. I know that my feelings are not unique. You have them. We all have them. We all have, in one way or another, inherited our ancestors' traumas. So my question is, what can we do about it? What can we do to heal the traumas of the past as individuals, as families, as societies? My very own discovery happened after many years of study of how museum professionals, as I, who work at cultural history museums, as I, can deal with the difficult, dissonant, taboo-related, untold parts of the past. Those parts that are so sensitive that you do not know how to address them. Those parts that hurt when you try to remember them or fully embrace what they implied for all who was involved. During the last few years, I have worked with the transfer of trauma from one generation to the next. My colleagues and I have interviewed more than 200 people in seven European countries to find out how the traumas of the past still affect the present. And each time we present our findings, we are approached afterwards by people with similar stories. People such as Frank, who had felt his mother's pain during his whole upbringing, no matter how hard he tried, he could never really reach her, never get really close, and he had felt rejected without her knowing why. He has learned just recently that she, as a child, had witnessed continuous bomb attacks. People such as Sally, who had fallen in love with a soldier of the enemy troops and had been punished harshly by the local society afterwards. To be able to cope, she had shut down her feelings and pretended that she did not care. Her granddaughter still feels excluded and lonely. We have learned that feelings such as shame, guilt, loneliness, or being an outsider can be passed down from one generation to the next. We have learned that not being able to cope with negative emotions or the punishment of the local society in some cases even led to violence behavior and abuse that affected the next generations heavily. We have learned that traumatic events often lead to silence and secrets that only editor extended and spread the pain. But how exactly can a trauma as such be passed down from one generation to the next? Studies from the fields of psychology, neuroscience and epigenetic suggest three ways. By being exposed to the trauma-related stress hormones while in your mother's womb, by learning from your parents how to behave in certain situations, and by having installed a kind of marker on your DNA. The first is obvious. If your mother is exposed to extreme fear while being pregnant with you, her fear stresses you directly through the umbilical cord. Also, the second way of transfer is quite logical. You are marked by what you experience, sense, see, and hear as a child. So if your mother or father have experienced something traumatic, their behavior is often accordingly, and you download it just by watching and internalizing. Do not trust foreigners. Never walk alone in the dark. Always have food nearby. The third way of trauma transfer has only been known for two decades or so. 
intense stress or sudden pain, acute fear of death or the loss of loved ones might result in the attachment of a kind of marker to the genes, a marker that assures that the body remembers the stress and how to react to it. It is this marker that can be passed down from one generation to the next through conception, and it is this marker received from your parents or grandparents that suddenly can be activated when you yourself experience a trauma. Your reaction will then be much stronger than it would be without this additional activation of inherited stress. Because you have been programmed already before being born, the memories are still there, hidden and unclear, but still there, and they can display strong messages. Watch out! The world is a dangerous place. Get ready to run or defend yourself. What impacted me and my colleagues most, though, while talking to our informants, was the despair on their faces and the sadness in their voices. Most of the time witnesses, meaning those who had been present at the traumatic events, said that they just wanted to forget, that they wanted to spare their children the tough stories. They did not feel others would understand or want to listen. Most of the children did not dare to challenge the silence, but some of the grandchildren did. They wanted to know what had happened, how it had felt like, and what it had led to. They needed information to understand what had shaped also them. If those who asked got honest answers, family relations improved significantly. To finally talk about long-hidden feelings was often painful for all, all involved, but in the end, positive and liberating. If questions, on the other hand, were not answered, when the traumatic events continued to be a secret, feelings of distance and suffering went on. Studies from many parts of the world confirm our findings. Trauma, not properly addressed, shapes individuals, families, children, grandchildren, and all also, and even the surrounding societies, more than we want to believe. They are individual traumas, but in many cases also collective ones, as many had similar experiences at the same time. And these traumas of previous wars, forced migration, abuse, or extreme loss of what is important to you, do not disappear by themselves. They have to be addressed to be released. They have to be addressed to be released. So, how can we do it? How can we release traumas and address the silence and secrets that often surround them? Comprehensive research from several fields of study states that healing begins with sharing and getting to know. Healing begins when secrets become stories. The past is not dangerous in itself, and it becomes less and less threatening the more we address it. We can go to psychologists to understand and cope with our individual traumas, but I believe that we need all the additional help we can get, taking into account how many of the individual traumas also are collective ones, and accordingly, how many we are who are struggling to understand somehow the same. As a museum professional, I believe in the power of museums that dare to address what is lying under the surface, in the dark, within individuals, families, and local societies. So let me take you on a journey to the museum of my dreams, a safe space where the untold is told, a safe space where healing can happen. Imagine that you, who have experienced the trauma yourself, come in and feel welcomed. That you meet museum professionals who really want to listen to you and whom you trust to transform your secret into a story that will benefit others. Imagine that you, who have parents or grandparents who have lived through a difficult time, enter a space where you see the faces of others who have been there, where you can read their stories, hear them talk, maybe even smell the past, feel how it had been like. A space where you see pictures of places you know, but have never seen this way. A space where you also get neutral information, balanced information, facts about what has happened, a larger picture of the events and how everything is related to one another. Imagine how you will start wondering 
how all of this also have affected you and what it will feel like when you finally find the answers you were looking for. And imagine, just imagine, what it would lead to if we all would seek to understand ourselves, our families, neighbors, and neighborhoods better. Just imagine how much more compassion we would have for one another and how much more peaceful our lives and our living together would become. I know it works. Not only because of all the scientific articles I have read and all the research we have conducted, but also because of the last secret I want to share with you. The last secret about my own family. My grandfather was never able to share what he had done and felt during the war. And also my grandmother died without ever saying a word about what had happened to her while being on the run for many long months. But they had built a bunker in the cellar of their house, a physical bunker, somewhere in the 1980s, more than 40 years after the war had ended. Only lately, their daughter, my mother, started to talk about her own memories, and she finally dared to read the information that I had found in archives and museums. And you know what? The healing has started within us, within her, within my siblings, and even within my children. We have simply become a more healthy family, and I wish the same for you. I wish you would never give up on finding the help and answers you need for a more peaceful life. I hope you start talking, sharing, and showing even more compassion for those around you. I hope that we, together, will turn secrets into stories.